Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God is good. God is good. Amen? Amen. Well, this morning we're going to continue our study, Complete Prosperity. Prosperity is to gain or advance in any good thing, to grow and increase, to be successful. It means completeness, soundness, safety, health. In other words, the blessing. Our scripture is 3 John 2. 3 John 2. I'm going to read it from the Amplified. Beloved, I pray that you prosper in every way and that your body may keep well, even as I know your soul keeps well and prospers. King James, beloved, I pray that you prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. Is there anyone here that wants to prosper and be in health this morning? Amen. Well, glory to God. We're talking to the right crowd. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Complete prosperity, spirit, soul, and body is the desire of the Father for us. But there is even as. There's an even as. Even as our soul prospers. And we found out that our soul is our mind, will, and emotions. And if we don't have a prosperous mind, will, and emotions, we won't prosper and be in health. Because our prosperity and our health is directly proportionate to how much our soul prospers. So we found out that prosperity is the will of God. Prosperity and the blessing are the same. Mean the same. Psalm 35 said, God takes pleasure in the prosperity of his servants, so it's not wrong to desire to prosper. God gets pleasure out of the prosperity of his servants. How much more his children, amen? How much more? It, It isn't wrong to prosper. It's wrong to be greedy. We talk about, oh, the blessing, the blessing. Well, what's the purpose of the blessing? Abraham was blessed so he could be a blessing. That's our reason. That's our desire. That's why we want to be a blessing. We want to be a blessing. Without being blessed, we can't be a blessing. How can we bless someone else if we're walking in abject poverty and sickness and disease? When our mind is going all over the place and it isn't prospering. So we saw that. We saw that man is a three-part being. 1 Thessalonians 5.23, I pray God your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless until the coming of the Lord. That means before he comes, that means in this earth. Today, walking in the earth. Be preserved blameless until the coming of the Lord. So that means here and now. We don't have to wait to get to heaven. I mean, that's, I don't know how we ever thought that we'd get healed in heaven. That healing's for heaven. There's no sickness and disease there. That prosperity's for heaven. That's dumb. There's no poverty in heaven. We're walking on streets of gold. So, we saw that. We also saw in order for us to have a prosperous spirit, we must be born again. Believe in our heart, confess with our mouth, Jesus is Lord. We must be born again to have that sin nature gone and become new creatures in Christ. Then we were looking at a prosperous soul, mind, will, and emotions. And we saw that our spiritual growth is determined by how much your soul has been changed by the word of God. How much your soul has been changed by the word of God. Not by circumstances, experiences, but by the word of God. We are hindered from living a spiritual life by a soul that thinks like the world instead of like the word of God. To prosper in your soul, you must be able to control your mind. And, and we are going to, down the road in our study, why do we have to control our mind? Because what we think about affects our emotions, and our emotions will set us in motion to whatever we're thinking about. So if you have, in other words, stinking thinking, your emotions get going with that, and that's where you're going to go. God designed our emotions to set us in motion. So, and we have a will... And our will kicks in because with our will, we decide what we're going to think. We make the decision on what we're going to think. So that's where our will comes in. We saw in James that it says to the saving of your soul. We're responsible for the saving of our soul, our mind, will, and emotions. So the soul as I said, is comprised of the mind, will, and emotions, and your mind is your thinking aspect. It's what you make your decisions with. 
Your will is your chooser. You choose what to think and you make a decision on that's what you're going to think. And your emotions are what you're feeling. So you get your mind and your, emotion, your will and act and you start going to how you're going to think. So the role of the soul exists to make decisions. God's not going to force anything on anybody. He's given man a free will and we make choices, either good or bad either in line with the word or in opposite direction of the word. So what you think with your mind interacts with what you feel, your emotions, and the result is a choice to act. Somebody says, I don't know why I did that. I didn't mean to do that. Well, you did that because that's what you've been thinking about. And what you were thinking about made you, you, with your will, you made a decision to think about that. And that's why you did what you did because that's what set your emotions going and that's the direction you went. So somebody that says, I don't know why I did that. I didn't mean to do that. You wouldn't have done it if you hadn't thought about it somewhere along the line. That's just the way it is. And we use that as a, well, I didn't mean to. Well, change your thinking. Get your soul prospering. Then we'll start doing what we mean to do. And we actually probably meant to do what we did. We just didn't want it to turn out as ugly as it did. So what you think with your mind interacts with what you feel. The most consistent decisions you make in a particular area are the product of the strongest desires you have regarding that area of life. You won't make, you won't have a strong desire and then make decisions opposite to that desire. And I mean, to me, this is all good news. You might say, well, this is pretty ugly teaching. Well, when we understand how this works, we can change the course. We can, it says, James says, you know, the whole course of nature is set on fire with the tongue. When we understand this and understand what words do, we start speaking the right thing. It gets in our mind and our thinking changes and it gets into our emotions. But that's a result of our will. So this is good news. You just find out some pressure's put on. You know exactly where you're at. Pressure's put on. Somebody puts pressure on, and however you react is what's in here. And somebody goes, oh, I may as well just quit. No, you know you've got to renew your mind, will, and emotions in that area. I mean, we're all having to change. It says we're going from glory to glory. We're continually growing. Continually, we will forever. So the decisions you make in a particular area, are the product of the strongest desires you have regarding that area of your life. You won't have a strong desire and then make decisions opposite to that desire. We're not created to function that way. So on a regular basis, what you think interacts with what you feel. And whichever of the two is most dominant usually determines your decision. For instance, if you know if you don't show up for work, you're going to get fired, even though you want to stay in the bed, you're going to get up. You're going to go. That's just a stronger desire not to be fired than it is to have an extra hour of sleep. It's just the stronger one. So then we started looking at a prosperous mind. We saw that the worlds were framed by the word of God. We saw that God never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. What he did yesterday, he'll do today, and he'll do tomorrow. And he's not a respecter of persons. He doesn't look down and say, hey, I like Tim, but I don't like Peter, so I'm not going to bless him. I'm going to make him suffer and wander through the earth like a beggar. God's not like that. Man might be like that. God's not like that. God doesn't have favorites. Well, except I'm his favorite. But you can be his favorite if you want to. You can be his favorite if you... I just think I'm his favorite. I heard Jerry Seville say that one time. I'm God's favorite. He says, you can be God's favorite too if you want, but as far as I'm concerned, I'm God's favorite. I thought if it's good enough for Jerry, it's good enough for me. I'm God's favorite. It's up to you what you want to do, but I've decided I'm God's favorite. Everything he said he would do, he will do for me. If I believe. All things are possible to him who? To him who God decides you're nice. If you had the right education, the right parents. No. All things are possible to him who believes. And I decided I'm going to be a believer. I'm going to believe whatever God said regardless. Regardless. So we had looked at that. We saw that the world's ways bring death. And, and one area, now, now we're going to be w- walking through how to have a prosperous mind. 
We've said we have to have a prosperous mind. We saw it's our responsibility in Romans chapter 12. It says for you to renew your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable perfect will of God. You do it. God didn't say, I'm going to reach down, pick out your old stinking thinking and put the good stuff in. He says, you renew your mind. You did not get a new mind when you were born again. You got a new spirit, not a new mind. And we're to renew our mind to line up with the word of God. That's our responsibility. If we're thinking wrong, it's because we haven't been getting this in. That's why we're a word church. Everything's based on the word. Not doctrines and traditions of man. Because if you start applying doctrines and traditions of man, it makes this, it says it makes the word of God to no effect. So you have to reach the point, we all have to reach the point, if you were raised in a Christian home that was very religious, that was very doctrine and tradition, you have to make a decision. If it doesn't line up with this, I'm not going to go with it. You have to make a decision that this, as I said before, it's a quality decision that this is final authority in your life. And it doesn't matter what you and I think about it. It's what does God think about it? We want to prosper and be in health. But if we're not thinking the way God thinks, our soul isn't prospering. And we're not going to make it. There's been too long that the body of Christ thinks they have to wander through life like a beggar. Singing dumb songs. Here we wander like a beggar through the heat and cold. Well, we have a lot of cold here, but I don't know about the heat. That's junk. You will not find that anywhere in the Bible. But you know what? Our flesh likes it. Because then if something doesn't go right, we can say, well, God just didn't want for me to have it. And put the blame on God. After all, I'm so good. I've done everything I have to do. So it's God's fault. He held out on me. He didn't want it. And that's the kind of thinking we've got to get rid of. Amen? Amen? So we had looked at that. The scripture I want to go to in this to, in the how to. How to renew our mind. You say, well, I'll just read the Bible. No, there's more to it than that. That's part of it, but there's steps to take. But the first one I would like to look at, understanding that we saw before that uh, my people perish for a lack of knowledge, that the world's ways bring death. By that, we mean the world's way of doing things. How many have heard about the economic horrendous situation? I mean, the economy's down. You can't do this. You shouldn't do that. Well, that's the world system. Will you find it in here where it says that the blood of Jesus won't work, the word of God won't work, the name of Jesus won't work if the economy is bad? Can you find it in here? Anybody? Then it doesn't affect me because it's not in here. Because it's not in here. If you're in car sales and only five cars are going to be sold that month, they're going to come to you. And people that didn't even know they wanted to buy a new car are going to come to you. Because God's going to see that you're blessed. But if you're believing your job to be your source, you'll probably sell none. Because our job is not our source. And if we end up there and we don't sell any, it doesn't matter either. Because God's our source, not our job. And he'll put opportunities in front of us that we never thought would happen. Witty ideas and ways to do things. He'll bring it to us. As long as we're looking to him. As long as our mind's renewed looking to him. And not our job as our source. Not as to our husband as our source. Or to hopefully maybe uncle whosoever might die and I might be in his will. Yeah, that sounds funny, but people do do that, you know. There are people out there thinking, maybe if somebody will die, and maybe I can inherit something. So let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2, please. First Corinthians chapter 2, we'll look at verse 7. But we speak 
the wisdom. And what's the wisdom of God? This. This is the wisdom of God. The word of God is the wisdom of God. So we speak the word of God in a mystery. Even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. Now here's the first thing where we have to make sure our mind is focused in on the word and not in the natural man. Not religion. Because people go, oh yeah, it's a mystery. Oh, the things of God are a mystery. Oh my, what a mystery. It's not meant for us to understand because it's a mystery. And then we read a little bit further which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. And people read that and think, princes, that must be rulers. That must be like a king. No, princes, Satan and his hosts. If he had known what we were going to get, he wouldn't have crucified the Lord of glory. So obviously, if it's in a mystery, what's it in a mystery for? Verse 9, but as it is written, eye has not seen nor ear heard, neither entered into the heart of man the things... Now, we really looked at this quite a bit on Wednesday night, so we won't now. Which God has prepared for them that love him. Now, do you love God? Then he has things prepared for you. Correct? According to the Bible, he has things prepared for you. If you love God, he's got things prepared for you. Now, was it, would it make sense? Does it make sense to know that if you love God, he has things prepared for you, and then he keeps it in a mystery so you can't find out what it is? Does that make any sense at all? I don't know why we think God is dumb. But if we think God's keeping it a secret from us, when he's prepared it for us, that's dumb. If God did that, it's dumb. It's prepared for us. If we love him, it's prepared for us. Who's it kept a mystery from? Satan. Verse 10. But God has revealed them unto us. How do we get a revelation of what God has for us? By his spirit. That's why Jesus said it's better I go away. Because if I go not away. The Holy Spirit. Your comforter. Your helper. Your counselor. Will not come. The things of God are revealed to us by his spirit. Jesus said my word is truth. My word is spirit and life. The words that I speak are spirit and life. So we know we're going to get it from here. But we need the Holy Spirit to give us revelation. Verse 11. For what man... Knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of a man. Even so, the things of God knows no man, just the spirit of God. Who knows the things of God? The spirit of God. Not man, but the spirit of God. So then people stop and say, well, I guess we're not supposed to know anything. Verse 12, now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of Why have we got the Spirit of God that we might know the things that he was talking about, the mystery that was hidden for us, that he might know, that we might know, that we might know the things of God. That we might know the things of God. They're freely given to us. By grace are you saved, not of works, lest any man should boast. Freely, free, freedom, freedom. Which things also we speak, not in words which man's wisdom teach, but which the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. You cannot compare natural things with spiritual things. You don't take spiritual things and compare them to natural things. You compare spiritual to spiritual. But the natural man, that doesn't mean the non-born again person. Natural, that means the person that doesn't have their mind renewed, that's walking in the ways of the world, according to the world system. Well, the flu's coming around, so therefore that means X number of percent get it. And in a household, X number percent get it, so I guess that's what we're going to get. That's thinking like the world. That's thinking like the world. God doesn't say that. Jesus already bore all my sicknesses and disease. It says he bore mine. If he bore mine, I don't have to bear any. So if that particular germ or flu or whatever's out there is coming around, I don't have to bear it because Jesus already bore it. I don't have to take it on me. It's not mine. Jesus bore mine. And if something comes and tries to attach itself to me, it's not mine and I'm not going to take something that doesn't belong to me. That's it. I'm not going to take it. 
I'm just not going to take it. It doesn't belong to me. Jesus bore mine. Jesus bore mine. Hallelujah. So now, verse 13, which things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teach, but which the Holy Ghost teaches, again, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man, the natural, the carnal thinking man, the sense-ruled man, the person that's ruled by their five physical senses, receives not the things of the Spirit of God. You cannot, if you're walking in the flesh, if you're walking according to your five physical senses, if you're thinking according to your carnal way of thinking, the way the world thinks, you will not be able to receive the things of God because they're spiritually discerned. And if you refuse to start thinking God's thoughts, if you don't make that 180-degree turn, you won't prosper and be in health because your soul's not prospering. So we need a prosperous soul. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. But, verse 15, he that is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. Verse 16, for who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of the anointed one. That's our inheritance. So we have to renew this mind that we have. We have to let that rise up from within. So, The world's way brings death. Isaiah had said, don't say something that's evil. Don't call it good. While sickness, I've heard Christians say, well, you know, God put that on them. God put that sickness on them to teach them something. It's a lie from the pit of hell. You're discerning natural, spiritual things. You're trying to figure it out with your natural mind, and it's a lie. That's why people think, oh, well, God caused them to have a car wreck. God caused them to die. God caused them to do this. Well, I don't want to serve a God like that. I got enough problems already. Why would I want to serve a God like that? I don't need it. That's calling evil good. And God said, don't do it. Poverty is not good. Jesus bore it. Anything in the curse is not good. Don't call it good. And God doesn't use the devil to teach his children. That being the case, let's look at 2 Timothy, please. We're going through steps on having a prosperous soul. How many need a prosperous soul? And we just keep going on. We think, well, I know it. We will never have our soul totally prosperous. Praise God for the blood. Rebellion is sin against the known will of God. When Joseph was tempted by Potiphar's wife... When he went in and she tried to entice him, and he said, no, I can't do this because I'll sin against God. He knew it was against God, what God wanted. It was against the blessing for him to go mess with Potiphar's wife. So he said, I'm not going to sin against God. Now, if he had done that, that would have been rebellion. But sometimes we make a mistake because we haven't gotten the word on it. That's not rebellion. That's not rebellion. Rebellion is against the known revealed. When God's revealed something to you and you go opposite to it, that's rebellion. Well, I don't care. I see it in the word that we have to watch what we say and you can have what you say, but I just don't believe in that anyway. I'm just not going to do that. I'm just going to say whatever I want. Yeah, you can. But you won't prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. Because that's a spiritual law that God put in force at the beginning of the world. So you, you can say, well, I, I, yeah, the word says that, but I've been redeemed from that. I've been redeemed from the curse of the law. You have. But too many people are wanting to say, I don't have to be under the law. The law is the word of God. The law means the word of God. And do you know what? The blessing and the curse are both under the same word. But we want to take part and not the other. Yes, we've been redeemed from the curse. What does that mean? Well, under the old... When they missed it, Satan just devoured them. But when we miss it, when we don't know the will of God in an area and we miss it, the blood of Jesus protects us. So Satan just can't come in and tear up our lives. Now, if I know I'm supposed to do something and I don't do it, he can But there comes a time where my people perish for a lack of knowledge. 
You see, we have everything we need to walk it out. And if we put it on our bedside and dust it off once a week and at at the main holidays that we like to think of, Resurrection Sunday and, and Christmas, we pick it up. Or maybe we dust it off to carry it to church. We have all the revelation we need. Now we're going to perish because we're not prospering in our soul. We cannot walk in prosperity and ignore the word of God. You know, it's like, like a frog in a pot. We've heard where they've caught these frogs and put them in a pot and they would jump out because they wanted to cook them and have frog soup or whatever they're going to eat with frogs. People eat frogs. It's, well, that's fine if you like frogs. I don't have, a, and, and probably if I was in a situation where that's what I had, I'd pray over it and eat it. You eat what's put before you. But anyway, they wanted to cook these, and the frogs would keep jumping out. So what they did, they put it in water that it was accustomed to, in its habitat type temperature of water. And then they turned the heat on, and it slowly, 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 slowly got warmer until they cooked them. The frog didn't know to jump out. It just slowly adjusted to it. If we're not in a place where we hear the word of God preached, and we're out there, you say, well, I can live without it. I can just be out there, and it's not going to affect me. You will be like that frog. If you're watching TV that you shouldn't be watching, you slowly will get, at first it's like, mm, I don't know if I should watch that. And then you try again, mm. But you go into it farther and farther, and you become like that frog. And you get used to the world's way. You get used to what's going on out there. And sometimes, by the time you catch it, it's too late. Let's look at 1 Corinthians. Well, no, we're back. Let's go to Hebrews 12, too. Hebrews 12, 2. Get some scripture on what I'm telling you. Hebrews 12. Well, let's read verse 1. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. We've got a cloud of witnesses up there. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so be easily beset us and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Well, I believe that sin is one works. We get into one ditch or the other. It's all grace or we think it's all works. It's also forgetting the word and going on. So in order not to be stumbling because of the sin... That weight, verse 2 says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Looking unto Jesus. If we keep our eyes focused on him, we won't have a problem. If we keep our attention on him, what does that mean? Our mind? Our mind? He's the author and finisher of our faith. If we, don't, if we ignore him, he, what has he got to finish? If we're not taking in the word, it's the word that brings faith. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Cometh. It's a continual process of coming. Where is it coming from? Where does faith come from? Well, he's the author of it. Jesus is the author of it, and he's the finisher of it. So everybody's faith is good. Don't say, I don't have good faith. You do. You might say, well, I don't have enough faith. Well, you know what? That's our fault. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. Every bit of faith we need for every situation in life is in here. Everything we need for every situation in life is in here. It's all in here. Everything we need is in here. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing and hearing continuously the word of God. If we're not continually hearing, we're not going to have faith because we're not giving Jesus anything to work with. Faith cometh. It's coming. It's coming. How? 
Jesus is the author and finisher of it, so it's good. But this is what he authored, and this is what he's going to finish. Hallelujah. Keep the word as your focus. Second Timothy, please. Second Timothy. And there's no other way but God's way. You might say, well, you're really quite dogmatic. You know, I don't, I'm, I'm not dogmatic. As Kenneth Hagin says, I'm not even pupmatic. <laughs> but this is what God said, and so I'm just telling you what he said. Either you accept what he said or you don't. That was one thing I found so nice about being able to teach the word of God. People don't like what I say. Don't put it off on me because I didn't author it. It's his idea. If you reject what I say, you're not rejecting me, but you're rejecting the one who sent me. You're rejecting him, the author. You're not rejecting me. You might think you are. Maybe you don't like the... I mean, we, we all probably have something, some idea of who we would like to stand up here and speak to us. God put me here. I tried to escape this city for ages. I tried to convince Dave we've got to move. We had to move before the children got too big because I wanted to make sure they came with me. Then they got big and I thought, well, I could still live without them. We could visit. Then we had grandchildren. I knew I was stuck. (laughs) God wouldn't let us escape. Tried. Tried. He wants us made free by knowing the truth. He wants his people free. He went and had Moses go to Pharaoh, let my people go. And he's saying today, let my people go. I've delivered them. I've set them free. But they keep wanting to go back to Egypt. Set my people free. Get their minds renewed. Get their thinking changed. If you've got any area in your life where there's struggle and strife and unhappiness and, and torment, your mind isn't prospering in that area. And this will do it for you. This isn't something I just read or heard Kenneth Copeland say. That we've walked this. We've been through some stuff that I wished we didn't go through. But we went through it because of our ignorance. And I so don't want anybody else to have to go through some of that stuff. Timothy. Chapter 3, please. And I'm going to read it out of a couple of translations and then we'll, we'll end there and we'll pick it up again another time. 2 Timothy 3. Verse 16, I'll read it from King James first. All scripture, all scripture. That means you don't cut some of it out. People have said, well, I don't think that's for today. Then why haven't you cut it out of your Bible? When we were told in the denomination we're in, and I'm not making fun of that denomination, please understand that. I'm not making fun of it. Oh, I'm thankful for my heritage. But they said part of the scripture is good for today and some of it's passed away. No, God never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So it's all scripture. It's given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Why? That the man or woman of God may be perfect, Thoroughly furnished unto all good works, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. I'm going to read it in two other translations. Hallelujah, I will. I have it here. And I, New Living Translation. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. There's no excuse for us to say, well, I just didn't know better. Listen to instruction. Listen to instruction. To make us realize what's wrong in our lives, it straightens us out and teaches us to do what is right. It is God's way 
His word correcting us. Remember, we read by the Holy Spirit, discerned by the Holy Spirit. It's God's way of preparing us in every way, fully equipped for every good thing that God wants us to do. The message translation says, every part of scripture is God-breathed and is useful one way or another, showing us truth, exposing our rebellion. When you hear a teaching or you're reading the word, never read the word without asking the Holy Spirit to give you a revelation of it. And something comes and it goes, Ugh. well, I reject that. I'm not. Get behind me, Satan. The word exposes where we're missing it. We're just not to rise up thinking, well, this is what I think. Like you all don't give a flip about what I think. It's not important in your life. What's important is what God says. That's what's important and that's what will change and that's what will deliver and that's what will direct and that's what will cause you to prosper and be in hell. What he says. And I'm not interested in what you have to say or your opinion if it doesn't line up with the word of God. But I don't have a problem if you come and say, look, this is my situation. I need help. I'll say, do you have a scripture you're standing on? You say no, and I'll say, okay, we better find some. Because I can pray for you forever and we can pour oil all over you. We can dance and do everything. But if we don't have something based on this scripture, it's not going to work. That's it. It's not going to work. Exposing our rebellion, correcting our mistakes, training us to live God's way. Through the word, we are put together and shaped up for the task God has for us. Glory to God. Aren't you thankful that the Holy Spirit moved on men of old to write this out for us? That we have that. Glory to God. Glory, 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 glory. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. So we've got the word that exposes areas. You know, it's as to be like little children. Just trust and believe God. Don't try and figure it out with your own mind. If he says it, just do it. We cannot figure God out with a natural mind. I read that to you. I read that to you. The natural man cannot understand spiritual things. Because they are spiritually discerned. So when you find something in there and say, well, I don't understand that. It doesn't make sense to me. Who cares? You make that decision. I don't care. It's in there. Holy Spirit, I thank you. You give me revelation. You pray Ephesians prayers in chapter 1 and chapter 3. The eyes of my understanding being enlightened. The eyes of my understanding being enlightened. Holy Spirit, I thank you. You're my teacher. You give me revelation. I don't know where we get the idea that what we think is greater than what God thinks. That we can try and understand God with the natural mind and the world's way of thinking. And more and more and more, science is proving that the word of God is true. More and more. Hallelujah. Glory to God. 